UFO phenomena is quite an elusive topic. Despite many years of documented encounters, there is still no confirmation from any official authorities, be it mainstream science or government, that there may be something otherworldly going on. On the contrary, there is often ridicule and avoidance whenever the subject comes up. Yet most of the general public believes that extraterrestrial UFOs exist and that the government is hiding information from us. Many people have had UFO sightings themselves. However, most people also don't give it much attention or thought, believing that it doesn't really affect us anyway and that we'll deal with it once official contact has been made. But what if the UFO phenomena is not what we thought it is, but has influenced humanity and the world at large for thousands of years? What would be the implications? Our views on life and existence, science and religion, spirituality and evolution, consciousness and psychology, as well as reality as we know it, would take on a whole new understanding when looking deeper into the UFO phenomena and the possibility of a higher alien intelligence affecting our world. Maybe we're not the main show here on Earth, and maybe not even on top of the food chain. Let's not forget, not too long ago we believed that the Earth is flat. What else will we discover? In general, it is impossible to get into any discussion about this topic with people who dismiss something right away without having sincerely looked into the evidence and research. There is no point in simply discussing beliefs and set viewpoints. Discussion is only constructive when it is not limited by personal preference, beliefs or a conditioned worldview. Open-minded objectivity is essential when seeking truth. With that in mind, we must also be discerning, because truth is often mixed with lies especially in a topic outside of what is socially and culturally accepted. It's a big swamp, but the sincere seeker who approaches the subject with a critical mind can see that, without any doubt, something otherworldly is going on and has been going on for a while. There is one important issue that needs to be considered when dealing with such fringe topics. Our own level of cultural conditioning. Many people project a certain typical image on the extraterrestrial phenomena based on Hollywood movies and sci-fi literature, which mostly tends to humanize intelligent alien beings in some way and keeps it on a very physical level, with aliens supposedly coming from another planet and acting out human qualities. What we see in the mainstream does affect how we view this topic, even if only unconsciously. The conditioning through official culture which has fictionalized this topic is deep and far-reaching. It cannot be underestimated. The question is, how to separate truth from lies? How can we find out what is really going on in this elusive field? What do we really know? And what do we just believe or assume? We should never underestimate the trap of wishful thinking and denial. Looking at it all with what the Buddhists call beginner's mind helps in the process of revealing the truth. No preconceived ideas or assumptions, but simply looking at it as it is cross-referencing the data and research out there, using logic and intuition alike, separating disinformation from reliable information, slowly putting together the pieces of this puzzle. It is obviously a topic where no one has the whole picture, and there's still much to discover. But at one point, when you have a certain amount of pieces, you can start to see an image arising. Let's look at some of these pieces and how the image could look like. When it comes to well-documented UFO cases, especially involving government and military documents, there is one book to point out, and that is Richard Dolan's UFOs in the National Security State, the chronology of a cover-up. Dolan comes from an academic background, giving him the much-needed critical but open mind when researching such matters. He holds an MA in History from the University of Rochester and a BA in History from Alfred University. Prior to his interest in anomalous phenomena, Dolan studied U.S. Cold War strategy, Soviet history, and international diplomacy. UFOs and the National Security State is a historical narrative of the national security dimensions of the UFO phenomenon from 1941 to the present. Included are the records of more than 50 military bases relating to violations of sensitive airspace by unknown objects, demonstrating that the U.S. military has taken the topic of UFOs seriously indeed. Some believe that UFOs are just developed Nazi technology or secret military projects but have nothing ET-like to them. Others explain UFOs with Jungian psychology as a projection of our collective. 
For anyone who doubts that the UFO phenomena is real needs to read this book. It is well documented and clearly shows that the government and military are very aware of the UFO issue and do not have a handle on it. One of the interesting things about the UFOs in the history of this country, 1952, a very big year. Why? Well, for one, it seemed like the entire nation was being invaded by UFOs. Civilians and military people alike around the country were watching these things. Military people reported them a lot. This is a memo from the Director of Scientific Intelligence for the CIA to the Director of the Agency, Walter Beadle Smith. In December 1952, and this is what it says. At this time, the reports of incidents convince us that there is something going on that must have immediate attention. Sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. It's the CIA. People don't just come out and say, boss, I think we're being invaded. That's about as close as you're going to get in a classified memo to the director of the Central Intelligence Agency in 1952. The really extraordinary encounter occurred when this object detached a smaller object from it, which then pursued the F-4 interceptor. The pilot pulled an extreme turn to get away from the object. And this small object turned inside his own arc and then rejoined the mother craft for a perfect rejoin. That's 1976. What can do that today, much less 35 years ago? Well, officially speaking, we don't really know. Unofficially, I think we do know. These are advanced technology that is not being operated, officially at least, by our own civilization. And therein lies the problem with the UFO phenomenon. Everyone in the world knows there's something going on, and no one in official power is ever willing to admit it. There are people who are so high down in their opinions and so skeptical about this without bothering to look at any of the evidence that they will say, well, the government did look into this. The government did have Project Blue Book. They investigated it. They found there was really nothing to this. I heard that there was a scientific investigation, too, that also debunked UFOs. That explanation to this day is used by the Air Force and by the government to dismiss the whole topic of UFOs. But here's the deal. Project Blue Book, a joke of an operation. I have a letter here from 1955 to the commander at Ent Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, Colorado, about UFO reports. In keeping with the purposes of the UFOB program, in this case UFOB means UFO, it is necessary to strive to reach as many case solutions as possible, thereby reducing the percentage of unknowns to a bare minimum. Not a minimum, a bare minimum. As pointed out in the UFOB guide, the word solution cannot always be used in the scientific sense when dealing with UFOB. For this purpose, it must more often mean that a given case meets a given hypothesis. If it looks like it might be a flock of birds, you don't have to bother investigating. Just put down birds, and it's fine. And we're told that they investigated a total of 12,618 sightings, and only 701 remained unidentified. Look, I'll tell you right now, those people didn't do one investigation that was worth a damn. That is the scientific foundation, if you can believe it, as to why your government continues to this day to deny that there is a UFO reality worth investigating. Dolan also examines the rising of a national security state or military-industrial complex independent of official government supervision, as 
well as the issue of disinformation and counterintelligence programs, COINTELPRO, designed to deliberately spread false information in order to keep the public away from the truth. Compartmentalization is the name of the game, on a need-to-know basis. That's how secrecy works. Many people who have looked into the topic of UFOs have come across the Disclosure Project, an organization under the guidance of Stephen Greer, which also reveals the government and military involvement in the UFO field. At first, the Disclosure Project seems to be a very good source and has a somewhat more serious image than your average UFO site. Greer and his project is quite popular these days, especially in the New Age movement. UFO enthusiasts seem to take Greer's work as a credible, reliable source and are happy to hear that our benevolent space brothers are here, possibly providing us with technology like zero-point energy, which the secret government is apparently hiding from us. According to Greer, we are also threatening the aliens and a possible contact scenario because of our space weapon program. While there is some valid information presented by Greer, with the very ideal objective of bringing about disclosure of the UFO phenomena through Congress, there also seems to be disinformation, in particular in regards to the intention of the visitors. Greer claims that there is no evidence of any negative behavior on part of the ETs. But is that true? UFO researcher Guy Malone writes about Stephen Greer, There are certain problems with the lesser known but equally sought after goals of the Disclosure Project, which hide, in plain sight, behind the noble top-line pursuit of disclosure, which should raise concerns. Namely, the seemingly religious zeal with which Dr. Greer promotes the intergalactic community we are supposedly being invited to join. These other non-essential to disclosure pursuits are built upon a single faulty premise, that UFOs are not ever harmful. It is simply unreasonable to believe that, as a noted UFOlogist, Dr. Greer has never heard of these or similar reports. Too much of the UFO community simply ignores all such reports in favor of either an undeserved loyalty to the UFOnauts or a hidden agenda, political, spiritual and or financial. Promotion of UFO beings as benevolent and the ideal of a peaceful intergalactic community is the hallmark only of uninformed researchers, well-informed disinformation agents, New Age acolytes and UFO cult leaders. If the government doesn't really know much and has no handle on it, as Richard Dolan has shown in his research, then that puts into question the disclosure through government as promoted by Korea and others. One has to ask, who is going to disclose what? Are we really so naive to believe that the government would just come out and tell us the truth, even if they knew what was going on? Sincere researchers in the UFO field are starting to look through Greer's agenda more and more, as his claims do not hold up to the data uncovered. Could Greer be a disinformation agent in classic Contail Pro fashion? Laura Nadjajic writes about Greer in her book, The Secret History of the World. In the present day, we have Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project. Based on the mail I get, it seems that many in the New Age UFO community think that this is a great and novel idea. However, history shows that it has been tried before. The one thing about Greer's effort that suggests it is just more and better Contel Pro is his attachment to the aliens are here to help us idea, which is directly contradicted by history. In regards to secrecy of the UFO issue, referring to Dolan's work, she writes, this brings us back to the problem of the secret state and its agenda. Some people believe that this secrecy is absolutely essential. They say that the public simply could not handle the truth about aliens. They say that there is no reason to spoil people's lives with the truth because there's nothing that the average person could do about it anyway. Is that really true? Would there be so much effort to conceal the alien agenda if disclosure of the truth wasn't harmful to that agenda? Dolan's chronological history of the actual interaction between UFOs and the public and the corresponding behavior of the military, the intelligence community, the media, the scientific community in its interaction with the public make this abundantly clear. It seems obvious from the documentary evidence as well as the behavior of the military in response to UFOs and the alien matter that the aliens do have an agenda and that, at some level in the layers of secrecy, there are those who know, at least on a need-to-know basis, what the agenda is. It seems abundantly evident that the secrecy has been enjoined on this group by the aliens themselves, 
What is more, a careful assessment of the evidence does not suggest a benevolent agenda. Now what would an alien agenda be that might not be in our best interest? A very important issue, which Stephen Greer and many supporters of the benevolent alien scenario seem to completely miss, distort or deny, is the topic of alien abductions. For the layman who has never looked into it seriously, it may be a topic to make fun of, making jokes about anal probing and such, but anyone who has ever researched that field in more depth knows that the picture is not very funny. There is a high strangeness to this whole abduction phenomenon which is hard to explain. Many abductions are not that obvious and can only be retraced through hypnosis, as the aliens seem to have an ability to mind control the abductee, erase memory, manipulate space and time, as well as implant certain thoughts, emotions, everything from bliss to indifference, and even false memories of what really went on in an abduction. This happens through the use of a hyperspace technology that makes our technology look like the Stone Age. Some abductions have been reported fully conscious without hypnosis, and there seem to be many similarities between the stories of thousands of reported abduction cases worldwide, independently showing a rather disturbing picture. Dr. David M. Jacobs has been doing research in the UFO abduction field for over 40 years, published several books and has worked with thousands of abductees, mostly using hypnosis techniques to reveal these experiences. He states, My research is based on more than 42 years of UFO research, in addition, since 1986 I have conducted over 1000 hypnotic regressions with abductees. I have tried to be as objective and as agenda free as possible. I have no new age, spiritual, religious, transformational or transcendent program to promote. I try to stay as close to the evidence as I can. However, there is no possibility that I have avoided error. The majority of evidence for the alien abduction phenomenon is from human memory derived from hypnosis. It is difficult to imagine a weaker form of evidence, but it is evidence and we have a great deal of it. Admitting to the difficulty of researching the abduction phenomena, Jacobs, however, rules out the idea that abductions are just a psychological or imaginary issue. Too many accounts from too many unrelated people tell the same developing stories over and over, which just don't fit into any psychological frame. So how does a typical abduction look like? Jacobs describes it in a nutshell. Abductions are a complex series of events and procedures directed by the abductors to passive or controlled abductees. In a typical or common abduction, humans are taken out of their normal environment by aliens. The people are rendered passive and cannot resist. They are taken aboard a UFO, their clothes are removed and they are made to lie on a table. A series of physical, mental and productive procedures are then administered to the subjects. People's physical bodies are probed and examined, sperm is taken, eggs are harvested. The aliens perform staring procedures during which they gaze into abductees' eyes at a distance of only an inch or two. These mind scan procedures appear to be neurological manipulations which give the aliens the ability to enter into people's minds. After the table procedures, abductees report that they are sometimes taken into other rooms where they are required to have skin-on-skin -skin contact with unusual looking babies. Abductees say that these babies seem to be crosses between humans and aliens. They call them hybrids. Abductees also see hybrid toddlers, older youth, adolescents and adults. Sometimes abductees report that they are required to perform tasks, that they are tested in some way. They say that machines are brought in to examine them. They sometimes are required to have a form of sexual intercourse with other humans and sometimes with adolescent and adult hybrids. They are returned to their normal environment and within seconds they forget what just happened to them. The individual abductee accounts are far more detailed. Not all are UFO related. Some have to do with underground bases. Dr. Jacob says that after all these years of research and putting the pieces together, he can see a picture emerging. 
It looks like there's a program in the works with a certain goal and that producing offspring may be one of the objectives behind the abduction phenomenon for the purpose of creating a hybrid race. Some skeptics blame Jacobs for inducing his own belief system through hypnotherapy into his patients and therefore creating false abduction accounts. However, this doesn't hold up with the evidence Jacobs and other researchers have come up with, much of it even without the use of any hypnotherapy. It only shows that skeptics haven't really looked into the research and are more trying to validate their own belief system rather than objectively looking for truth. In regards to the typical debunking of the abduction phenomena, be it through the scientific or spiritual community, Jacob says, In my 40 years of UFO research, the last 20 of which spent studying the abduction phenomenon, I have learned a simple evidence truism. All debunkers make one or more of three fundamental mistakes. They do not know the evidence, they ignore the evidence, or they distort the evidence. Any of these errors would be catastrophic and perhaps even scientifically dishonest when writing about something of accepted scientific consequence. Leaving in mistakes is tantamount to ignoring or to distorting the evidence. Unfortunately, when it comes to abductions, all debunkers comply with the evidence truism. There are no exceptions. Dr. Rick Strassman, author of DMT The Spirit Molecule, hypothesizes that alien abductions are brought on by the accidental release of DMT, dimethyltryptamine, produced by the pineal gland inside the brain. While conducting DMT research in the 1990s at the University of New Mexico, Dr. Strassman advanced the theory that a massive release of DMT from the pineal gland prior to death or near death was the cause of the near-death experience NDE phenomenon. Several of his test subjects reported NDE-like audio or visual hallucinations while others also reported contact with other beings, alien-like, insectoid or reptilian in nature, in highly advanced technological environments where the subjects were carried, probed, tested, manipulated, dismembered, taught, loved and even raped by these beings. It is interesting to note how similar the accounts of his test subjects, who were administered DMT intravenously, are in comparison to what can be found in abduction research. DMT certainly is a mystery molecule that seems to open doorways to another world or reality. However, Strassman's theory that abduction experiences are brought on by the accidental release of DMT seems to be short-sighted when taking a closer look into the alien abduction scenario. A respected researcher and abductee herself had been Dr. Carla Turner. She authored three books on the abduction phenomenon, Into the Fringe, Taken and Masquerade of Angels. She died of a strange fast-acting cancer in 1996 after being threatened for her work. She was just 48 years old. Dr. Turner confirmed the work of Jacobs and others. However, she thinks that the creation of her hybrid race is not the whole picture, as there are many cases of abductions that show different behaviors and agendas. She really must have struck a chord, as she was harassed by agents and military alike throughout her life until her death. According to her research, Dr. Turner believes that humans are being used as a resource by these aliens in many ways. Analysis. Aliens can alter our perception of our surroundings. Aliens can control what we think we see. They can appear to us in any number of guises and shapes. Aliens can take us, our consciousness, out of our physical bodies, disable our control of our bodies, install one of their own entities, and use our bodies as vehicles for their own activities before returning our consciousness to our bodies. Aliens can be present with us in an invisible state and can make themselves only partially visible. 
Abductees receive marks on their bodies other than the well-known scoops and straight line scars. These other marks include single punctures, multiple punctures, large bruises, three and four fingered claw marks and triangles of every possible sort. Female abductees often suffer serious gynecological problems after their alien encounters. And sometimes these problems lead to cysts, tumors, cancer of the breasts and uterus, and to hysterectomies. Aliens take body fluids from our necks, spines, blood veins, joints, such as knees and wrists and other places. They also inject unknown fluids into various parts of our bodies. A surprising number of abductees suffer from serious illnesses they didn't have before their encounters. These have led to surgery, debilitation and even death from causes that doctors can't identify. Some abductees experience a degeneration of their mental, social and spiritual well-being. Excessive behavior frequently erupts, such as drug abuse, alcoholism, overeating and promiscuity. Strange obsessions develop and cause the disruption of normal life and the destruction of personal relationships. Aliens show a great interest in adult sexuality, child sexuality and in inflicting physical pain on abductees. Abductees recall being instructed and trained by aliens. This training may be in the form of verbal or telepathic lessons, slideshows or actual hands-on instruction in the operation of alien technology. Abductees report being taken to facilities in which they encounter not only aliens, but also normal-looking humans, sometimes in military uniforms, working with the alien captors. Abductees often encounter more than one sort of alien during an experience, not just the greys. Every possible combination of grey, reptoid, insectoid, blonde and widow's peak have been seen during single abductions, aboard the same craft or in the same facility. Abductees report being taken to underground facilities where they see grotesque hybrid creatures, nurseries of hybrid humanoid fetuses and vats of colored liquid filled with parts of human bodies. Abductees report seeing other humans in these facilities being drained of blood, being mutilated, flayed and dismembered and stacked lifeless like cords of wood. Some abductees have been threatened that they too will end up in this condition if they don't cooperate with their alien captors. Aliens come into homes and temporarily remove young children, leaving their distraught parents paralyzed and helpless. In cases where a parent has been able to protest, the aliens insist that the children belong to us. Aliens have forced human abductees to have sexual intercourse with aliens and even with other abductees, while groups of aliens observe these performances. In such encounters, the aliens have sometimes disguised themselves in order to gain the cooperation of the abductee, appearing in such forms as Jesus, the Pope, certain celebrities and even the dead spouses of the abductees. Aliens perform extremely painful experiments or procedures on abductees, saying that these acts are necessary but give no explanation why. Painful genital and anal probes are performed on children as well as adults. Aliens make predictions of an imminent period of global chaos and destruction. They say that a certain number of humans will be rescued from the planet in order to continue the species, either on another planet or back on Earth after the destruction is over. Many abductees report they don't believe their alien captors and foresee instead a much more sinister use of the rescued humans. Further commenting on that list, Carla Turner states, In every instance from this list, there are multiple reports from unrelated cases, confirming that such bizarre details are not the product of a single deranged mind. These details are convincing evidence that, contrary to the claims of many UFO researchers, the abduction experience isn't limited to a uniform pattern of events. This phenomenon simply can't be explained in terms of crossbreeding experiments or scientific research into the human physiology. Since most abductions are not remembered consciously, Dr. Jacobs believes that there are millions of abductions worldwide of people who have not the slightest idea that they had been abducted. Dreams and issues of missing time can be hints that an abduction has actually occurred. Sometimes people remember later in life, after 30 to 50 years or so, that something like an abduction had occurred earlier in life. Hypnotic regression can help to uncover more. However, there's also physical evidence at times, such as body marks, and there are conscious recollections without the need of hypnosis. According to abductee stories, most abductions are performed by the typical grey alien, which has become a sort of pop culture icon thanks to Hollywood. Sometimes there are reptilian and humanoid entities present who seem to oversee such procedures. Some people believe that abductions are performed because these aliens are dying, 
claiming that they need our DNA and that in a sense we are helping them. On the other hand, some supporters of the benevolent alien scenario suggest that abductions and genetic manipulation of humans happen on purpose for our benefit in order to upgrade our DNA for the shift. However, this assumption doesn't hold up in light of the overall research and merely downplays the abduction phenomena by painting an inferior and innocent image of the aliens or seeing them as saviors. The gray aliens seem to be just biogenetic robots performing assigned and programmed tasks but are not in charge nor a race on their own. tiny mouth slit, a resemblance of a nose and ears, but there's no suggestion that they use five sensory perception, eat, breathe, or use speech like humans do. Communication is done by telepathy. Dr. Jacobs also believes that the gray alien is a product of human alien genetic manipulation, and the reason why mouth, ears, and nose have a regressed, underdeveloped appearance is simply because they are not used as a human would use them. ourselves to facts in this field and I think that is extremely important we should repeat that ten times a day as we go through the work in this area the problem of course with the abduction phenomena as with a lot of ufology is that the nature of the alien activity is designed deliberately to keep us from having much in the way of concrete evidence designed that way it is not an accident It seems that the secret government and military-industrial complex, which is in possession of alien technology and is involved with these non-terrestrial forces on some level, is not fully in control, but are themselves duped by these visitors. Looking into military abduction accounts, my lab, researched by Dr. Carla Turner, she has reports by people who have been abducted regularly by aliens and then also started to get abducted by military personnel who then questioned the abductees about what the aliens wanted from them and what they conveyed to them. Whatever is going on, the alien forces seem to have their own agenda and are not just in partnership with the secret government. Deception is the name of the game, not only through the military-industrial complex, but also through the aliens themselves. Military abductions are happening, but they seem to have a different purpose than what Stephen Greer suggested. He believes that all abductions are simply staged by the military to give the aliens and ETs a bad name. Abductions, in my assessment of this, there is no question there is an abduction phenomenon. And it is not, as has been argued by some people, most notably Dr. Stephen Greer, simply a military phenomenon. In fact, I think it's irresponsible to make this argument. There is something... Yes, you can clap for that. It, it uh, boggles my mind, to be perfectly candid here, that a researcher can make such a blanket statement. You have a phenomenon that's gone on globally for a long time. You have individuals that are describing highly consistent things in terms of their abduction experience. And uh, I don't know what else it can be other than a kind of religious-like zeal that can cause a person blindly to say the only abductions that occur are military. Uh, this I find indefensible. 
And I think that a, a, a careful review of the evidence certainly leads to that conclusion. Abductees and contactees seem to get duped by their alien friends as well, being told they are special and they have certain important functions to perform in the coming future. Some abductees claim that they have given permission for abduction through their unconscious mind and have developed a kind of a Stockholm Syndrome, worshipping their abductors. What needs to be kept in mind is that these beings are able to create virtual realities, trigger emotions and implant thoughts. I, believed, uh, I believe now that the reported and confirmed details in all of these reports are strong evidence against accepting consciously recalled alien encounter reports at face value because of the illusion capabilities, because of the screens and because of the virtual reality technology that we have witnessed being manifest by these entities. I believe that if we build our theories on, the, on such information, the consciously reported information only, we're building on sand, on illusions that the aliens create for us, and I think to confuse and mislead us. Now this is not to say, however, that all alien encounters are virtual reality events, because there is also plenty of very strong evidence for the physical nature of many of these encounters. So to be perfectly objective, the definition of abduction would have to include any event or scenario that is generated externally for the targeted person, whether it be a physical encounter, a virtual reality scenario, or a telepathic contact. The first matter is the intrinsic deception at the heart of this agenda. And that's something that's become clearer with every new report that surfaces. Whether we choose to call it screen memory, telepathic mind control, technological mind control, or virtual reality scenarios, the entities involved in the abduction phenomenon employ masterful illusory capabilities. And I don't think the importance of this fact can be stressed strongly enough. It must affect all of our thinking and our research when it comes to these alien-human contacts. When we talk about the possibility of an alien race of high intelligence that exists outside our range of perception on a higher density, it doesn't mean that they are automatically spiritually evolved or loving angels. This also doesn't imply that there aren't any benevolent beings on higher realms of existence. However, there is a heavy romanticizing of the alien UFO phenomena going on based on wishful thinking and assumption. Not many people actually question the intentions of these beings. Dimensions are lateral and infinite, and densities are vertical and only seven. Okay. Um, and density refers as much to state of awareness, you know, because obviously if you're in a higher density, you're more aware of the multiple dimensions on the density below you, you know, and as, as you go up, you know, this just increases because we as human beings are extraordinarily aware of, you know, many creatures inhabiting the animal kingdom and the world around us, the natural world and so forth. So we're aware of many dimensions below us. And we'd have to say that these higher dimensional or higher density beings have the same perspective on us uh, that we have on, and that's kind of a scary thought, especially if you, if you realize that they may not have your best interest at heart, and just as the farmer has a lot of awareness of the many dimensions of his herd of cows, he, uh, he knows them very well because he knows which ones he's going to butcher to have put in his freezer. Could there not be the possibility that there is an alien intelligence that has been around far longer than we imagine and who may look at us like we look at and use in many ways lower life forms on this planet as a resource and even as food? Food doesn't have to be physical and these beings seem to feed off our emotions and energy. But maybe our official culture with its institutions is also a product of and influenced by the other, the alien mind or predator as Don Juan called it. Hence the debunking, ridicule and avoidance of this topic in the public. Usually, if people admit that there might be other life forms visiting this planet, they tend to project human qualities into these visitors, rejecting anything that doesn't fit into this conditioned image of our space brothers. It's a typical, the aliens don't behave how they are supposed to, excuse and denial of the abduction phenomena. Who are we to even assume to know how another non-human life form thinks or behaves to begin with? 
Some abductees have had healings done by their alien abductors, but maybe it is for a whole different purpose than just caring for the sake of caring. A common explanation in New Age circles is that abductees attract these experiences to them, based on the popular law of attraction and create your own reality concepts, sometimes claiming it's their karma. This seems more like an escape and justification without carefully studying the phenomena. The hyped New Age teachings of today, which many people believe without questioning, shouldn't justify anything that may not look pretty. Millions of children have died in Iraq since the war. Do we also say, it's just karma, or they just attracted it because of their thoughts and just led them to their fate? Can we see the misuse of such popular ideas when dealing with these issues? Carla Turner states in that regard, There is a theory that says abductees who perceive their experiences in a negative way only do so because they themselves aren't spiritually or psychically advanced. Persons with higher cosmic development have positive alien encounters, so the theory goes. And those who have painful or frightening experiences are merely spiritual Neanderthals. This is a pet theory of researchers who claim that aliens, whether objectively real or not, serve as mirrors of our spiritual nature on an individual or species-wide basis. Having worked with so many decent, honest, positively oriented abductees, however, I believe this theory is wrong. It is worse than wrong. It is despicable. As despicable as blaming a rape victim for the violence committed against her. This attitude leaves many abductees feeling doubly violated. First by the aliens who took them, and then by the UFO researchers to whom they turn for explanations and help. Daniel Pinchbeck and others suggest that these entities performing the abductions are aspects of our psyche and how we perceive them depends on how we look at them. He wrote in 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl, Are the visitors real or imaginary? They are both and they are neither. Any entity only possesses relative reality, including ourselves. Entities who manifest on other forms of consciousness, such as the greys, are at the same time separate from us and aspects of our own psyche. We are the ground of their manifestation, and it is only by attaining a non-dual perspective that we can understand them. We are supposed to learn to work with the elementals and also alleviate their suffering. It is clear from the abduction accounts that the visitors are suffering. Like dusty insects attracted to flame, the greys yearn for our qualities of soul warmth, despite their cunning and technological acumen these qualities remain beyond them. They are intelligent and sentient, hence aware of their exiled status. Unable to escape their desold condition, they desire to draw humans into their lower world, sustaining their half-lives on our subtle energies. They appear to be utilizing their dream world technologies in a serious and desperate attempt to find a way out of their cul-de-sac. Everything exists and nothing exists at the same time. The aliens are separate from us, and at the same time they are part of us. While there is obvious truth to such ideas from a higher perspective, these considerations are useful only for the expansion of perception, but are not useful for practical application. By simply dismissing strange aspects of reality as existing and not existing at the same time, or separate from us and at the same time part of us, is to generalize life with oversimplified spiritual perspectives such as everything is an illusion or we are all one. There is a danger to philosophize and essentially buffer up the issue without seeing the limitations of such higher truths in our state of being and existence. In general, there seems a tendency in the New Age arena and certain progressive conscious movements to come to an oversimplified application of spirituality and quantum mechanics. Also, by defaulting to the assumption that the grey aliens are beings who suffer and crave what we have, Pinchpick and others ignore much of the evidence and research that show quite a different picture. Looking at what Dr. Carla Turner and other abduction researchers have found out, it seems more likely that the grey alien is as much suffering and yearning for our soul warmth as a robot performing certain tasks. 
The grey aliens don't seem to be in charge, but are being used as biogenetic working drones by other more powerful beings such as reptilians or insectoids who oversee the procedures and who actually seem to be able to plug into a grey alien and work or see through them. Implanted screen memories can also hide and distort of what an abductee has really experienced and paint a false image of what the greys really are. Screen memories may be unusually vivid dreams, recollections of meeting spirits or even of friendly interaction with aliens. Hypnosis can get past screen memories to uncover another layer of experience which is most often less agreeable. I remember just lying there, trying to relax. I'd opened my eyes, I seen a red light flowing across the ceiling which it almost looked like uh, the Aurora Borealis. Dan and Joyce Aaron say the room was dark except for the unusual light, which they describe as about four or five feet in diameter. They say it hovered over the baby's crib at the foot of their bed where their one-year-old daughter Heather slept. Dan says that when he tried to get up, he found himself immobilized. That was the most frightening feeling I guess I've ever had in my whole life is not being able to move. I was screaming for him to help me because I couldn't move. And I didn't know that he was paralyzed too. And we both sat up in the bed at the same time. And I said, what the hell was that? Dan agreed to an on-camera hypnosis session with Carpenter, during which he revisited that memorable night in 1976, the night he saw the red light over the baby's crib. This time, under hypnosis, he remembers more. He recalls cowering in the corner of his bed as he watched alien beings take his daughter Heather from her crib. I went to the crib. He went to the crib. Uh huh. I can't move. You can't move. We don't have any control over what's happening. What do you see happening now? He took her. Under separate hypnosis, Dan's wife, Joyce, recalled the same sequence of events. They both say little beings marched them outside, and together the family was floated onto a spaceship. I never wanted it to happen to my children. I didn't realize until later that it had. But when they took her, I couldn't do anything. Abductions start as early as infancy and can occur till late in life. Some people have been abducted hundreds of times. Many abductees are living in fear, not knowing when the next taking will happen, not being able to prevent it, not being able to talk about it for obvious ridicule in the public. Many need to even hide these experiences from their families. Some are so utterly confused that they go mad, even committing suicide, paying a good quality of life. Be realistic about what can and cannot be done. Stay close to your families. Confide, you don't need the burden of carrying this around without being able to talk about it. Abductees have reported that anger and getting upset at the entities does actually help. Also by educating themselves and learning more about the abduction and UFO phenomena, they can create an awareness which seems to offer protection. As the saying goes, knowledge protects ignorance and dangerous. I think we need to recognize that deceptions are employed at almost every level of this interaction to keep abductees from knowing about the actual events and the actual entities involved in these encounters. To me, maybe I'm just a suspicious sort, this implies that there's something they don't want us to know about. And often what seems implied from the reports is that there is something within us, the humans, something of which we could be capable, something of resistance or altering of this scenario that the abductors absolutely do not want us to be aware of. They go to great lengths to program our thinking 
about our encounters with them, that we are subordinate, that we are helpless, or that we are dependent, or that we belong to them, the, the list goes on and on. And they go to a great deal of trouble to convince us, in every way that they can, that we can do nothing about controlling these situations. The good news is that in a number of cases in the past couple of years, that hasn't proven to be true. Abductees are finding more and more specific instances in which they are able to resist the illusion <coughs> suggestions, in which they are able to say no to procedures, and in fact when they have been able to break free of actual controls. This to me is a great step forward and I think it's going to be something growing with any, with any luck. We're going to find abductees are realizing there are ways to, to change this entire pattern of activity. But what is very disturbing is the complete denial of this issue, not only in the mainstream scientific community, but especially in the progressive truth and New Age movement. The topic of alien abductions is mostly treated as if it is non-existent, and that is the best way to keep a secret. Looking at the high strangeness and hyperdimensional aspect of the UFO and alien activity, one can say that it is certainly not
he's right, you know. Other hints in ancient history and scriptures that talk about a possible hyperdimensional control system, a paraphysical phenomena which is indigenous to planet Earth. The Gnostics are giving us some insights into the idea of hyperdimensional realities and beings inhabiting them. In Gnostic psychology, the noetic science of the mystery schools, archons are an alien force that intrudes subliminally upon the human mind and deviates our intelligence away from its proper insane applications. Working through telepathy and suggestion, the Archons attempt to deviate us from our proper course of evolution. Their most successful technique is to use religious ideology to insinuate their way of thinking and, in effect, substitute their mindset for ours. According to the Gnostics, Judeo-Christian salvationism is the primary ploy of the Archons, an alien implant. In the Gnostic view of human society, the Archons are alien forces that act through authoritarian systems, including belief systems, in ways that cause human beings to turn against their innate potential and violate the symbiosis of nature. Because the Archons need human complicity to gain power over humankind, anyone who assists them can be considered a kind of Archon, an accessory. How do humans assist the Archons? One way is by accepting the mental programs of the Archons, that is, adopting the alien intelligence as if it were human-based and implementing those programs by actually enforcing them in society. In other ways, by actively or passively conforming to the agenda so proposed and imposed. Their most successful technique is to use religious ideology to insinuate their way of thinking? Now that is very interesting indeed and puts also the whole new age world of spiritual teachings as well as religion into a different light, doesn't it? The story of the Archons is similar to what Don Juan talked about in The Active Side of Infinity by Carlos Castaneda. Ah, that's the universe at large, Don Juan said, incommensurable, non-linear, outside the realm of syntax. The sorcerers of ancient Mexico were the first ones to see those fleeting shadows, so they followed them around. They saw them as you're seeing them, and they saw them as energy that flows in the universe. And they did discover something transcendental. They discovered that we have a companion for life. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. You have arrived, by your efforts alone, to what the shamans of ancient Mexico called the topic of all topics. I have been beating around the bush all the time, insinuating to you that something is holding us prisoner. Indeed, we are held prisoner. That was an energetic fact for the sorcerers of ancient Mexico. Why has this predator taken over in the fashion that you are describing, Don Juan? I asked. There must be a logical explanation. There is an explanation, Don Juan replied which is the simplest explanation in the world. They took over because we are food for them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in chicken coops, the predators rear us in human coops. Therefore, their food is always available to them. No, 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 I heard myself saying. That is absurd, Don Juan. What you're saying is something monstrous. It simply can't be true for sorcerers or for average men, or for anyone. Why not? Don Juan asked calmly. Why not? Because it infuriates you? Yes, it infuriates me, I retorted. Those claims are monstrous. I want to appeal to your analytical mind, Don Juan said. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradiction between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of beliefs, or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our hopes and expectations and dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetousness, greed and cowardice. It is the predators who make us complacent, routinary and egomaniacal. 
But how can they do this, Don Juan? I asked, somehow angered further by what he was saying. Do they whisper all that in our ears while we are asleep? No, they don't do it that way. That's idiotic, Don Juan said, smiling. They are infinitely more efficient and organized than that. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators engage themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist. A horrendous maneuver from the point of view of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. Do you hear me? The predators gave us their mind, which becomes our mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. I know that even though you have never suffered hunger, you have food anxiety, which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which after all is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them. And they ensure, in this manner, a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. Looking at Don Juan's words in the light of what we have explored so far, we should maybe put on a different lens when reading Castaneda's books, no matter if Don Juan was real or not, as some people like to argue over. They contain a great amount of esoteric knowledge when read in the right context, much of it resembling Gurdjieff's Fourth Way teachings. Our reality might indeed be controlled by denizens of a higher reality. Gurdjieff refers to them in the story of the evil magician, cited by Uspensky in in search of the miraculous. There is an Eastern tale which speaks about a very rich magician who had a great many sheep. But at the same time, this magician was very mean. He did not want to hire shepherds, nor did he want to erect a fence about the pasture where his sheep were grazing. The sheep consequently often wandered into the forest, fell into ravines, and so on. And above all, they ran away, for they knew that the magician wanted their flesh and skins, and this they did not like. At last the magician found a remedy. He hypnotized his sheep and suggested to them first of all that they were immortal and that no harm was being done to them when they were skinned, that, on the contrary, it would be very good for them and even pleasant. Secondly, he suggested that the magician was a good master who loved his flock so much that he was ready to do anything in the world for them. And in the third place, he suggested to them that if anything at all were going to happen to them, it was not going to happen just then, at any rate not that day, and therefore they had no need to think about it. Further, the magician suggested to his sheep that they were not sheep at all. To some of them he suggested that they were lions, to others that they were eagles, to others that they were men, and to others that they were magicians. And after this all his cares and worries about the sheep came to an end. They never ran away again, but quietly awaited the time when the magician would require their flesh and skins. This tale is a very good illustration of man's position. The Sufi were also hinting at manipulation and deception through hyperdimensional forces, especially in regards to people seeking spiritual experiences. William Chittick wrote in The Sufi Path of Knowledge, Nowadays most people interested in the spirituality of the East desire the experience, though they may call what they are after intimate communion with God. Those familiar with the standards and norms of spiritual experience set down by disciplined paths like Sufism are usually upheld at the way Westerners seize upon any apparition from the domain outside of normal consciousness as a manifestation of the spiritual. In fact, there are innumerable realms in the unseen world, some of them far more dangerous than the worst jungles of the visible world. Al-Arabi himself said, so preserve yourselves, my brothers, from the calamities of this place, for distinguishing it is extremely difficult. Souls find it sweet, and then within it they are duped, since they become completely enamored of it. Let's consider what these sources tell us, from abduction accounts to the Archons, Predators, the Evil Magician and Aliens. Could they all relate to the same phenomena, manipulating humanity since the beginning of time? Where did religion originally come from? Could popular New Age teachings be influenced by these same forces? 
A lot of channeled and new age material tells us to just focus on love and positive thoughts since we create our own reality. We should ignore anything negative or unpleasant, telling us that eventually the light will win anyway and we need to just watch it unfold, bathe in the photon belt and let the divine plan unfold. Is there manipulation going on in the new age movement for the purpose of welcoming alien entities as friends and saviors? Or maybe just as a distraction from reality? Laura Nadiajic concludes, if anything, the so-called New Age movement has been so heavily inculcated with the idea that one must not ever think about negative things, that they, above all other people, are most subject to the predations of higher realms. If you don't know about something, you cannot defend yourself against it. The consistent deflection from the truth of the state of so-called higher realms by masses of published material over the many years suggests almost a program of disinformation. It was beginning to look as though there was something or someone out there who didn't want us to know something. Having looked now more at the so-called negative alien scenario, the question comes up, are there any good aliens? How would the higher positive and spiritual non-human intelligence act? Would they interfere with free will and perform abductions? Would they help humanity against the bad aliens or the evil elite and save us? Or is it more up to us humans to learn our lessons in order to truly evolve spiritually, discerning truth from lies, learning and gaining knowledge of what is truly going on without being helped by forces of whom we really don't know much about to begin with? What are these beings who claim to want to help us and land on our shores as promoted through popular New Age channelings these days? That doesn't mean that there aren't benevolent forces out there, but the negative alien scenario is being overlooked and denied in many ways. Maybe once we have learned our lessons, being able to truly see what is going on and act, behave, evolve accordingly, then the good ETs will come and join us or we will join them. But in the meantime, it is up to us to grow and learn, discern truth from lies, true revelations from clever forms of deception. In our current state of being and evolution, we are more prone to being manipulated than joining any form of galactic federation of higher spiritually evolved beings. Isn't that obvious? We must become that first ourselves. And the major part of conscious evolution is not just about trying to focus on love, but also making the darkness conscious and learning the lessons therein, within and without. As the Russian mystic Boris Muraviev said, illusion, thinking it is reality, takes reality for illusion. Maybe the we are all one new age slogan, as true as it is from a higher perspective, must also be carefully re-examined with a sober and objective eye. Sure, Bush and Gandhi are one, but one of them doesn't seem to have any conscience at all and not even the remote ability to feel any compassion, love or understanding, fully cut off from the higher centers of consciousness. Is he or others in power really human to begin with, just because he looks like one? What does it mean to be human? We always say that this is just human behavior, but never question it. Have we ever noticed how people project all these qualities into the world leaders without ever considering that they simply may not think or feel like regular folks do, may not even be genetically wired as the average man, but can perfectly imitate and act that way and fool us along the way? This doesn't necessarily mean that Bush or other political figures are alien hybrids, but relates to another greatly misunderstood and ignored topic, psychopathy and political ponderology. From a hyperdimensional perspective, psychopaths may be even used as portals through which negative aliens can work through. Who needs aliens when we've got psychopaths? <laughs> you know, I mean... But, you're, but the psychopaths are being motivated by, by, by hyperdimensional things. Yes, and, and also Lizzie's yes, and yes. Grays, right? Who are uh, Grays on are, the fourth... Well, Grays are cybergenetic yeah. probes. They're not even real beings. They're like, almost like... They're like plant-like, living-like robots. Sure. You know, they're like a cross between a plant and a critter, and, mm -hmm. and they grow them like plants, you know, and they, and they send them because they can function in our reality much more easily than uh, the overlords who have great difficulty making their vibrations uh, match with our reality. And uh, they've also been working on hybridization projects to hybridize beings that can cross densities, that can be by density, that can move between densities, because they want to use these bodies themselves as incarnational opportunities 
when they, you know, in, in a sense, uh, uh, to use them as portals into our world. Millions of children are reported missing each year, never to be seen again. Did they just run away, or is there a more sinister truth to it? What may be the goal of this abduction and hybridization program that is going on in complete secrecy? Where is it all leading to? Some suggest as a replacement after cataclysmic changes have wiped off the majority of the population, like a reseeding. This may sound like a bad sci-fi movie or fear-mongering to some people, Yet anyone who has sincerely looked into it knows that the UFO and alien phenomena has a darker side that can't be just ignored. It is interesting to note that if there is something presented which may not look that pretty, it is sometimes automatically judged as fear-mongering or being negative. Some people seem to mistake objectivity for negativity and wishful thinking for positivity. Most of what people see as negative or positive are their subjective projections and opinions that don't really reflect the world as it is. We're just looking at some of the pieces of the puzzle and the possible emerging picture and resulting questions we may have to ask ourselves. It's all just information. What we do with it and how we react to it, be it fear, denial, discomfort, excitement or inspiration, is up to each one of us. Discomfort in examining our fears can serve a purpose, if used or applied correctly. There is a chance for healing from a shamanic and esoteric perspective. It is good to put oneself into a state of vulnerability when looking at the darker aspects of our reality or of oneself. Truly looking at it, facing it and not giving the ego a chance to explain it all away so we can go back to our comfort zone and ultimately go back to sleep. It's not about buying into fear and panic either, but about gaining knowledge and understanding. Sometimes things need to be confronted without automatically defending our beliefs and views, allowing us to look at the world and ourselves more objectively, not only in regards to the UFO alien issue, but in many other aspects as well. That's part of the awakening process and raising consciousness. One thing is for sure, the UFO and alien phenomena is real. Non-human intelligent entities are and have been visiting Earth, most likely interacting with humanity for thousands of years. The question is now, why are they here? Do they really come from outer space and a different planet? Or are they just hiding outside our perception and have been here all along, or maybe both? There are people who suggest that all we have to do is show love and project love on these beings and that's how we become one and enter the golden age. Is that really the way and understanding of love, or is that part of the New Age disinformation program, welcoming our space brothers as friends and saviors? Intent is important, yes, we need to be positive and loving, but intent without really seeing what is going on objectively, separating truth from lies, essentially does more harm than any good. Isn't it interesting, as we all focus on global issues such as the environment, self-sustainability, the fake war on terror, economy, the banking system, etc. All important topics that need to be addressed and looked at. But all along, there seems to be something else going on which we totally ignore, deny, even laugh about, or try to explain away with questionable spiritual concepts or mainstream psychology. The high strangeness of UFOs, aliens, abductions and hyperdimensional realities may hold major clues for what is happening and has happened on our planet in regards to history, the rise and fall of nations, religions, evolution, culture, wars, conspiracies, human behavior, psychology, basically humanity's existence as a whole, even potentially the very creation of it. Maybe the elite, which seems to control the world these days through government, media, military and transnational corporations, are mere puppets to their hyperdimensional masters who have been manipulating humanity for ages. It seems to be happening before our eyes that they have been creating a ruthless uh, race in which to incarnate themselves at the time of this upcoming macrocosmic quantum event 
so that they can rule over the rest of humanity, whatever remains, uh, in the higher density state. In other words, they want to lock this planet into their evil uh, garden spot for them to have control and domination. They think, you know, of course, for all of eternity. That's their plan. That's their intention. And, uh, you know, we would like to see that that doesn't happen. We'd like to see a, a future freedom for people. And as Caesar said, that, that also is possible. But the people, you know, can't do it until they can connect together in a certain way. And they cannot connect together in a way that can block that hyperdimensional. In, in other words, what we want to do is we want to cut off their power supply. There are all these pathological people on our planet, and they're getting fueled by these hyperdimensional negative beings that are negative. You can't even plumb the depths of their negativity. You read about the most horrible crimes that have ever occurred committed by so-called humans on this planet, and you're getting a little bit of the picture of what their internal landscape is like. What are the implications for humanity when considering the possibility that hyperdimensional alien entities have manipulated humanity through belief systems and genetics since the beginning of time, or since the fall from Eden, as some may want to call it, all the while feeding on us energetically, emotionally, as well as physically? There are ancient accounts that hint to the reality of hyperdimensional control in alien life forms. There are cave paintings and scriptures, writing of the Gnostics and Sufi, the Native Americans and various ancient esoteric teachings. This underlying hyperdimensional reality that is behind our history and how it, you know, extrudes itself into the historical timeline and how you can observe these long uh, historical events and see the movement of that hyperdimensional energy through you know, the actions of human beings, through historical cycles, through uh, the behavior of groups of people, through the manipulations, things emerge. This is the age of transformation, but also the age of deception. As the frequency raises on the planet, what we might be experiencing sometime in the future is an intersection of densities and the beings inhabiting them. Perhaps the aliens haven't really traveled from a distant planet, but have been here all along. Some researchers suggest that the Anunnaki are returning to Earth. Maybe they never left, but have been here this whole time, just right outside our range of perception. As one abductee said, they may see us as their property and Earth is their farm. We are the resources and food. Or another more disturbing quote by an abductee. You know, to them we are just cockroaches. We might laugh at such statements, but millions of people are going through these experiences which the mainstream labels as psychological issues. Maybe we should give the abductees a closer listen, as well as the researchers in that field, before we look away too quickly. These entities are feeding off our emotions and energy, and it seems they are trying to keep us in a frequency prison through genetic and other forms of manipulation.
However, one needs to understand how to read and interpret it. Looking at what we found out about manipulation through hyperdimensional beings, it is obvious that a lot of channeled material these days is suspect to great deception from higher sources. There are different levels and degrees of channelings, depending on many factors. The topic of channel information needs to be examined very carefully. Higher sources may be able to contact us that way, when asked for, and when it doesn't infringe free will or interferes with the learning process of the one asking. However, who is coming through and what is the source really saying is the question. Channeled material should never be taken as fact and proof alone, but one should cross-reference it with other material and combine it with scientific research. There are some sources that actually encourage that approach and tell us that it is up to us to learn, discern and gain knowledge, hence becoming more aware and conscious and consciously engaging in the process of evolution and awakening. In that sense, we are the ones we've been waiting for, as the Hopi Indians would say, or we are our own rescue team, as another channel source states. But just focusing on love and light and visualizing the best outcome is not going to work and actually feeds the negative agenda. This attitude may be the greatest deception and is exactly what the alien intruders want us to do. They may be behind the emerging New Age religion and New Age thought to begin with, and they seem to be taking advantage of our good nature. Who is to judge what is a good outcome to begin with? Good is a very subjective statement. What is a good outcome for the aliens might be not so good for humanity and vice versa. We need to understand our subjective limited view and perception of good and bad dark and light in regards to the big scheme of creation and all intelligent life within. Are we bad because we eat plants and animals? True spiritual work entails more than just focusing our intention of what is possible. It means becoming aware and becoming aware conscious entails seeing the world in oneself as it is, as one is, objectively, dark and light, without rose-colored glasses on or projecting into it how we like it to be or not to be. Before we can create something new and better, we need to clearly see what is going on in ourselves and in the world. Otherwise more damage will be done and it's like a blind man stumbling around in the porcelain storm. There is still much to find out about this topic. This is just some food for thought, no pun intended. However, one thing is for sure, there is already enough well-documented material out there that shows and proves the possibility of an alien agenda which might not be quite what we have hoped for. The high strangeness and paranormal aspect of this phenomenon make it very hard to study. The fact that these beings and UFOs act in stealth and secrecy with obvious intent to keep the truth away from humanity at large doesn't make the issue easier and doesn't speak well for them. One has to ask, why would benevolent beings act that way? Why would good aliens take thousands if not millions of people against their free will? What are they really here for? In the words of Dr. Carla Turner, and it becomes clear from these details that the beings who are doing such things can be seen as spiritually enlightened with the best interest of the human race in mind. Something else is going on, something far more painful and frightening in many, many abduction encounters. As to researchers who claim that the ETs are here to help us evolve some higher consciousness or that they're here for some other positive purpose, saving our planet, promoting world peace, etc., I challenge those researchers to incorporate anomalous data into this view. Theories are starting places for research, not proven conclusions, and UFO researchers must be willing to expand and alter their pet theories according to the data they uncover. It would be wonderful if we could shape ET experiences into something positive, but until the details of abduction encounters, all the details, are given serious consideration, I think it's dangerous to cling to theories that ignore data that will not fit. We owe it to ourselves to speak the whole truth.
We need to get out of our habit of romanticizing anything that has to do with alien intelligent life according to our wishful thinking, nor deny the UFO reality completely out of conditioned non-belief, nor buying into any fear. This means growing up and becoming spiritually mature, being able to look at the world as it is, the dark and the light, without preference, and understanding what dark and light really means to begin with, moving from subjectivity towards objectivity, re-examining our beliefs and so-called spiritual knowledge we have gained over the years, which we at times just repeat without question. Everything from Eastern and Western religious teachings to mainstream New Age stuff and various spiritual teachers who have been on Oprah and on mainstream TV, marketing a passive, self-centered kind of spirituality to the masses in this billion-dollar heavy New Age industry. What is really going on? A true awakening or further manipulation and control? The deception in this day and age is massive and cannot be underestimated. There is much disinformation in the New Age movement and UFO field these days. Most of them are not even purposely spreading disinfo, but they are duped themselves, caught in their own subjective tunnel vision and wishful thinking. As Laura Nadiajic states, Let me make it clear at this point that I am convinced that a lot of honest, sincere, hard-working individuals are being duped and or controlled without being fully aware of it. From the viewpoint of esoteric work, Truth and objectivity should be one's principal goal. It's interesting how the popular New Age teachings these days promote subjectivity, to just focus on the self and shut out the outside, to ignore the bad and keep manifesting reality according to one's desires and wishes. Is this really what spirituality and conscious evolution is all about? Perhaps the popular New Age teachings and create your own reality concepts are corrupt in many ways. Universal truths mixed with lies painting a false picture of what spiritual evolution truly means, making us believe we are already God on our level to keep us in our self-inflicted prison. In this day and age of transformation and global change, it may be advisable to look more into what Don Juan called the topic of all topics, UFOs, hyperdimensional realities and the beings inhabiting them, the magicians that play with us, our reality and consciousness. It is also not something that is just now happening. It seems to have been going on for quite a while, thousands of years. These beings are operating outside the realm of space and time. And that is exactly why the manipulation and control is so unnoticed by the general population. It transcends our comprehension and works through our own minds. It is the subtlety of this phenomenon which makes the deception so hard to see, because it is already ingrained in our way of life, our culture and civilization. This also puts a big question mark on the topic of disclosure. The UFO phenomena has a strong paranormal and hyperdimensional aspect to it that can be simply ignored. Many supporters of disclosure and exopolitics seem to ignore or oversimplify that issue. we are subjected to is happening and has already happened through our minds and beliefs. The religious, spiritual and genetic manipulations throughout the ages by hyperdimensional beings and methods we are only scraping to understand and most of us are not even aware of to begin with. It's state-of-the-art mind control. Are perhaps the aliens themselves behind the new world order and quest for global enslavement? Most people still have a hard time realizing that 9-11 was an inside job and that Al-Qaeda is as fake as the war on terror. If the population of this world can be already so easily deceived by such obvious means, how will they ever look through a manipulation and deception by beings they are not even aware of and whom they even might welcome as their space brothers in the near future? Interesting times indeed. In the words of Elton Turner, husband of Dr. Carla Turner, I believe that our very thoughts and consequently our behavior as a race of sentient beings are being undermined through the power of insinuation and the implantation of controlling devices in our bodies by non-human, most of the time, entities. 
This is truly the most effective way to invade and conquer. I do not trust such creatures, no matter what I've been told about their altruistic motives. We, as a race, have never been free to discover our own true identity. Every social advance we attempt is thwarted by some maniac who springs up with almost divine grace to lead us into madness. Every major religion has managed to find an excuse in its teachings to destroy non-believing fellow human beings. A part of me shudders every time I hear of yet another killing based on 2,000-year-old hatreds. What law allows us to continue with such atrocities? What influence keeps such hatred and fears alive? Why are we abductees so afraid to ask for help from our own society? We have been invaded, but I do not yet believe that the battle is over. Invasion with sticks, knives or guns is a human reality, not necessarily a universal one. There are very sophisticated mechanisms being used in the invasion of our world. Why should our invaders use pointed sticks against us when they can get us to sharpen sticks and use them against each other? Can there be a more successful military campaign than one in which no shot is fired and in which the conquered populace gladly and openly welcomes their enslavers? We are being programmed mentally and socially to accept our invaders as saviors, not a conquering force. The researcher asked me if I personally knew of harm that has come to anyone at the hands of or because of the aliens. Yes, harm has come. My early youth was damaged severely by the unconscious knowledge that I was being used by some non-human agency. It took me 40 years to recognize that the fears which guided me daily were not of my own making, and that the rebellion I constantly felt was engendered by my contempt for the powerful invisible agents that forced me to do things that I knew were wrong even as I was doing them. For example, I did not want to marry the person who became my first wife, yet I had no control over the decision. Before we were married, we were jointly abducted and subjected to severe programming. The results brought no happiness to either of us. We both starved for love and companionship, even though we tried with all our might to find them. My son was also one of their subjects and is miserable and lost. He's an artistic person with so many unknowable fears that he's paralyzed. I know of abductees murdered by mutilations, reports of which are suppressed immediately and completely, by cancers that no physician has ever seen before, and by madness that has led to suicide. In my opinion, these acts were not caused by brothers of any sort. I do not believe that all is lost, however. I have felt a guiding hand that helped me to discover happiness and inner peace amid all this chaos and misery. What I have come to understand is that that hand is only there when I take responsibility for my own happiness and do something about whatever is bothering me. It is time that we think hard about ourselves and what we have on this gem of the universe, our home, our planet. There are laws governing the actions of our invaders, rules guiding their actions and patterns of behavior we can discover if we will make a concerted effort to discern them. We humans have something valuable that is desirable to and usable by the alien forces acting on us. I feel it is time we take back that which is ours, that we use all our resources to discover the laws that govern reality and become the beings that we intrinsically know we are. We're in a very unstable period of our history. It's like everything's bouncing around. That is exactly, in my view, the type of environment in which some monumental mistake will occur, in which the secret will come out in some way. I don't know how. I don't know what the trigger will be. But it's going to happen. When, I don't know either. I predict within 10 years. Now, when it happens, there's going to be attempts, you know this, to control the spin. Okay? It's going to happen. Um, and so it's going to be our job, the job of any responsible researcher and your job, to ensure that that does not happen. We've got to make sure that the actual truth comes out, even if it's horrible. Even if it's horrible, especially if it's horrible. There's no other way we're going to be able to deal with the reality until we learn the full import of what is going on. But there may, be, there may be some extraterrestrial or interdimensional or non-human intelligences 
that may not be working to our best interest. If we don't acknowledge that at least as a distinct possibility, I think we're fools. We have to, even if their intentions may not be bad. What happens to indigenous cultures when they encounter a highly technically proficient society? We know. And maybe in the long run things get better for them? I don't know, you can decide that for yourself. But the point is that we have to be vigilant against a variety of fronts here. Hope and fear. Fear is an enemy, we know this. Because when we are afraid, we react irrationally to things. We don't think through. Hope is an enemy too, though. That sounds kind of wrong, doesn't it? Everyone likes to have hope. Don't give up hope. But here's the problem with hope. Hope also deludes. We need to have a cold eye. We have to be able to look at reality in as alert and awake a fashion as we, as we can. What is true higher consciousness? Well, it starts with awareness, with seeing things as they are. Not as you want them to be, not as you hope they can be. You have to see them as they are. And um, it is only through going over that first large hurdle, I feel, that we can really attain a true higher consciousness, a true awareness in which we are awake, not asleep. No matter what the truth ultimately proves to be, we have to go for it. I mean, without it, we're like children playing with shadows. And we're ignorant and we're certainly unempowered to deal with and confront whatever the real entities are behind this masquerade. To take it all at face value is foolish. To take none of it at face value is ridiculous. Investigations into this field cannot be, there cannot be anything more important for us to be doing right now than to dig past our wishes, dig past our fears, and dig for objective reality and understanding. What is truth and what are lies in the world of UFOs, aliens, abductions, and hyperdimensional realities? We ought to make an effort to find that out. As Carla Turner said, we owe it to ourselves.